The Russo-Japanese War, Part 4, February to Spring, 1904. Port Arthur, on the Laodong Peninsula, had been fortified into a major naval base by the Russian Imperial Army, since it needed to control the sea in order to fight a war on the Asian mainland. Japan's first military objective was to neutralize the Russian fleet at Port Arthur. The Battle of Port Arthur began with a surprise night attack of the night of the 8th to 9th February 1904. It was done by a squadron of torpedo boat destroyers on the officially neutral Russian fleet. The attack continued after the launch of torpedoes with a surface battle until morning. In greater detail, here is what happened. Admiral Togo had received false information from local spies in and around Port Arthur that the garrisons of the forts guarding the port were on full alert, so he was not wanting to risk his capital ships to the Russian shore artillery. So he held back his main battle fleet. Instead, the destroyer force was split into two attack squadrons. One squadron with the first, second, and third flotillas to attack Port Arthur, and the other squadron with the fourth and fifth flotillas to attack the Russian base at Dalny. At about 22.30 or 10.30 p.m. on Monday, February 8, 1904, the Port Arthur attack squadron of 10 destroyers encountered patrolling Russian destroyers. The Russians were under orders to not initiate combat and turned to report the contact to headquarters. However, as a result of the encounter, two Japanese destroyers collided with each, with each other and fell behind. The remainder became scattered. At about 28 minutes past midnight, the first four Japanese destroyers approached the port of Port Arthur without being observed and launched a torpedo attack against the protected cruiser Palada. It was hit amidships, caught fire, and keeled over. The second target was a pre-dreadnought battleship Retkazan. It was hit and holed in her bow, or the front part of her ship. The other Japanese destroyers were less successful. Many of their torpedoes got caught in the extended torpedo nets, which apparently were put up quickly after the surprise of the first attack. This prevented the torpedoes from striking the vital parts of the Russian battleships. Other destroyers arrived, but were too late to be a surprise, and made individual attacks instead of attacking in a group. They were, however, able to disable the most powerful ship of the Russian fleet, the battleship Cesarevich. The Japanese destroyer Oboro made the last attack around 0200 or 2 a.m. By this time, the Russians were fully awake and their searchlights and gunfire were more accurate. Close range torpedo attacks were then impossible. Even though the Japanese squadron had ideal conditions for a surprise attack, the results were relatively poor. Of the 16 torpedoes fired, all but three either missed or failed to explode. Luck was against the Russians though, as two of the torpedoes hit their best battleships. The Red Vizan and the Cesarevich, as well as the Palada. These ships were put out of action for weeks, needing major repairs. The surface engagement of February 9th, 
1904. Following the night attack, Admiral Togo sent his subordinate, Vice Admiral Dewa Shigeto, with four cruisers on a reconnaissance mission to look into Port Arthur Anchorage and to assess the damage. By 0900, Admiral Dewa was close enough to make out the Russian fleet through the morning mist. He could see 12 battleships and cruisers. Three or four seemed to be badly listing or to be aground. The smaller ships outside the harbor entrance seemed to be in disarray. Dewa approached to about 7,500 yards or 6,900 meters of the harbor. Still, no notice was taken of the Japanese ships, so he was convinced that the night attack had been successfully paralyzed the Russian fleet. So he had his ships sail away to report to Admiral Togo. Dewa didn't know that the Russian fleet was getting ready for battle. Apparently, they were usually looking disorganized. Dewa urged Admiral Togo to immediately attack with the main fleet. Dewa said that the moment was extremely advantageous. Admiral Togo would have preferred to lure the Russian fleet away from the protection of the Russian shore batteries. Dewa's mistakenly optimistic conclusions meant that the risk was justified. Admiral Togo ordered the 1st Division to attack the harbor with the 3rd Division in the rear. The 1st Division had six pre-dreadnought battleships, the Hatsuse, the Shikishima, the Asahi, the Fuji, and the Yashima, led by the flagship Mikasa. The second division consisted of the armored cruisers Iwate, Azuma, Izumo, Yakumo, and Tokiwa. These two groups had shared with them about 15 destroyers and 20 small torpedo boats. In reserve were the cruisers Kasagi. Chitose, Takasago, and Yoshino. The Russians were commanded by Admiral Stark, and he had the pre-dreadnought battleships Petropavlovsk, Sevastopol, Perisvet, Bobeda, Poltava, Cesarevich, and Retvizan. He also had the armored cruiser Bayan and the protected cruisers Palada, Diana, Askold, Novik, and Boyarin. Upon approaching Port Arthur, the Japanese came upon the Russian cruiser Boyarin which was on patrol. Boyerin fired on the Mikasa at extreme range, then turned and retreated. At about 12 noon, at a range of about five miles, combat began between the Japanese and the Russian fleets. The Japanese concentrated the fire of the 12-inch guns, the biggest guns, on the shore batteries while using their 8-inch and 6-inch guns against the Russian ships. Shooting was poor on both sides, but the Japanese severely damaged the Novik, Petropavlovsk, Poltava, Diana, and Askold. It became obvious that Admiral Dewa had made a critical error and the Russians had recovered from the initial destroyer attack, 
and the battleships had steam up. In the first five minutes of the battle, the Mikasa was hit by a ricocheting shell which burst over her, wounding the chief engineer, the flag lieutenant, and five other officers and men, wrecking the aft bridge. At 12.20, Admiral Togo decided to run away. It was a risky maneuver that exposed the fleet to the full brunt of the Russian shore batteries. Despite the heavy firing, the Japanese battleships completed the maneuver and rapidly fled out of range. The Shikimasa, Mikasa, Fuji, and Hatsuse all took damage, sharing seven hits amongst them. Several hits were also made on Admiral Kamimura Hikunojo's cruisers as they reached the turning point. The Russians, in return, had received about five hits distributed amongst the battleships Petropavlovsk, Pobeda, Poltava, and the Sevastopol. During this same time, the cruiser Novik had closed to within 3,000 yards, 3,300 yards or 3,000 meters of the Japanese cruisers and launched a torpedo salvo. All the torpedoes missed, but the Novik got a severe shell hit below the waterline. The outcome. The Battle of Port Arthur had resulted in no major warship losses, but the IGN had been driven from the battlefield by the combined fire of the Russian battleships and shore batteries. This gave the Russians a minor victory. The Russians took 150 casualties to around 90 for the Japanese. Even though no ship was sunk on either side, several took damage. However, the Japanese had ship repair and dry dock facilities in Sasebo with which to make repairs, whereas the Russian fleet had only very limited repair capability at Port Arthur. It was obvious that Admiral Dewa had failed to press the reconnaissance closely enough, and that once the true situation was apparent, Admiral Togo's objection to engage the Russians under their shore batteries was justified. The formal declaration of war between Japan and Russia was issued on February 10th, a day after the battle. This attack against a largely unassuming and unprepared neutral power in peacetime had been widely compared to the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. In 1907, the Second Hague Conference adopted provisions regarding the rights and duties of neutral powers on land and sea. This prohibited nations from committing any acts of hostility against neutral countries or persons, as well as requiring that a declaration of war be given before commencing the attack on a targeted party. More actions at Port Arthur, February to December 1904. On Thursday, 11 February 1904, the Russian mine layer, mine layer Yenisei, started to mine the entrance to Port Arthur. One of the mines washed up against the ship's rudder, exploded, and sank the ship. 120 of the ship's crew of 200 were lost. Yenisei also sank with the only map, indicating the position of the mines. The Boyarin was sent to investigate the accident and also struck a mine, 
and was abandoned, although it stayed afloat. She sank two days later after hitting a second mine. Admiral Togo set sail from Sasebo again on Sunday, February 14, 1904, with all ships except for Fuji. On the morning of Wednesday, February 24th, an attempt was made to scuttle five old transport vessels filled with concrete to block the entry to Port Arthur, sealing the Russian fleet inside. The plan was foiled by the Retrozan, which was still grounded outside the harbour. The ships were to be sunk in the deep water channel to the port. They were sunk too deep to be effective, though. In the poor light, the Russians mistook the old transports for battleships, and an exalted Viceroy Yevgeny Alexeyev telegraphed the Tsar of his great naval victory. After daylight revealed the truth, a second telegram needed to be sent. On Tuesday, March 8, 1904, Russian Admiral Stefan Makarov arrived in Port Arthur to assume command from the unfortunate Admiral Stark. This raised Russian morale. Most Russian sailors did not have a very high opinion of Stark. He raised his flag on the newly repaired Askold. On the morning of Thursday, March 10th, the Russian fleet took the offensive and attacked the blockading Japanese squadron, but had little effect. On the evening of March 10th, the Japanese tried a trick of sending four destroyers too close to the harbor. The Russians took the bait and sent out six destroyers to chase them. Then the Japanese mined the entrance to the harbor and moved into position to block the return of the destroyers. Two of the Russian destroyers were sunk. despite Admiral Makarov trying to come to the rescue. On Tuesday, March 22nd, Fuji and Yashima were attacked by the Russian fleet under Makarov, and Fuji was forced to withdraw for repairs. Under Makarov, the Russian fleet was growing more confident and better trained. In response, on Sunday, March 27th, Togo again attempted to block Port Arthur, this time using four more old transports filled with stones and concrete. The attack failed again, with the ships being sunk too far away from the entrance to the harbour. On April 13th, Makarov transferred his flag to the Petropavlovsk. Then he left port to go to the assistance of a destroyer squadron that he had sent on another reconnaissance to Dalmi. He was accompanied by the Russian cruisers Askold, Diana, Novik, along with the battleships Poltava, Sevastopol, Pobida, and Perisved. The Japanese fleet was waiting, and Makarov withdrew towards the protection of the shore batteries at Port Arthur. However, the area had been recently mined by the Japanese. At 9.43 a.m., Petropavlovsk struck three mines, exploded, and sank within two minutes. The disaster killed 635 officers, men, and Admiral Makarov. 
at 10.15 a.m., Pobeda was also crippled by a mine. The following day, Admiral Togo ordered all flags to be flown at half-mast, and that a day's mourning be observed for his fallen adversary. Makarov was replaced by Admiral Nikolai Skridlov on April 1st. Skridlov was unable to reach his command, however, due to the Japanese blockade. He just remained at Vladivostok, overseeing the Vladivostok cruiser squadron until recalled to St. Petersburg on December 20th. Through the period from April 13th to December 20th, the Russian fleet at Port Arthur had no official commander actually present with them. The Battle of the Yalu River The Battle of the Yalu River lasted from April 30th to May 1st, 1904, and was the first major land battle during the war. It was fought near Wiju, near the modern village of Sinuiju, North Korea, on the lower reaches of the Yalu River, on the border between Korea and China. The strategy of the Russian commander in the Far East, General Alexei Kuropatkin, was to conduct a stalling action, while waiting for enough reinforcements to be brought up to the front through the single-track Trans-Siberian Railway to take the offensive. He estimated it would take at least six months to build his forces up to suitable levels. He had also received strict orders not to get in the way of the Japanese progress through Korea from Viceroy Yevgeny Alexeyev, but to hold the line at the Yalu River to prevent the Japanese from crossing into Manchuria. On April 22nd, Kuropatkin dispatched the Eastern Detachment under the command of Lieutenant General Mikhail Zasulich with 16,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and 62 artillery pieces to fight a static delaying action at the north bank of the river. However, this force was spread out in small units over a 170 mile front. The Japanese army could concentrate its efforts on any single point of its choosing. Furthermore, General Zasulich did not hold the Japanese in very high regard. Most of the Russian forces were deployed near Wiju, blocking the main road from Korea to Manchuria. Small detachments guarded the bank up and down the river. The Japanese Situation After the success of the Imperial Japanese Navy at the Battle of Chemumpo Bay on February 9th, the way was clear for the Imperial Japanese Army to deploy the 2nd, 12th, and Guards Divisions of the Japanese 1st Army to Korea. This was commanded by Major General Baron Tamamoto Kuroki. The total strength of the Japanese force was about 42,500 men. The Japanese Army advanced quickly northwards from Chimelpo, which is now called Incheon, with advance units entering Pyongyang on February 21st. They entered Anjou by March 18th. They had learned from the first Sino-Japanese War about the logistics and support needed for the campaign. They hired about 10,000 local laborers at wages well above the local norms. They also paid for any food and supplies procured 
locally. This contrasted greatly with the behavior of the Russian troops previously in northern Korea. By seizing the port of Chimalpo, Chinampo, which is now Nampo in North Korea, at the mouth of the Taidong River, outside of Pyongyang, the Japanese were able to land the remaining components of the First Army by March 29th. By April 21st, the Japanese First Army was concentrated and hidden south of Weiju. The Japanese were in the same positions on the southern bank of the Yalu River that they had been in in August 1894. The Japanese knew the exact locations of the Russians' deployment from intelligence by forward scouts, disguised as Korean fishermen. The Russians made no attempt to conceal their positions. By April 23rd, the Japanese knew the layout of the Russian trench line and details of the defensive positions around the area of Antong. Intelligence was so effective that the Japanese estimate of the Russian troop strength was only off by 1,000 men too many, and the estimate of the guns was only two less than the actual number. The Japanese made much efforts to keep their positions hidden. Screens of trees, millet, and bushes were used to conceal activity as well as roads, artillery, and other equipment. The prelude to the major action took place at 21.45 or 9.45 p.m. on April 25th when two battalions of the Japanese 2nd Division seized the two islands in the Yalu River without opposition. After reinforcement at 0400 or 4 a.m. on April 26 by units from the Guards Division and a brief firefight, <coughs> the forward Russian observation post withdrew to the main Russian lines on the North Shore. Japanese engineers determined that 10 bridges, about 1,630 yards or 1,490 meters long each, would be needed to cross the river. A third of these were steel prefabricated pontoons, which weighed 100 pounds each, each pontoon. The remainder were made from local resources. In full view of Russian positions, the Japanese began building a causeway across the Yalu River. It was immediately targeted by two Russian artillery batteries. With the Russians busy with this, the Japanese prepared nine other bridges that could be quickly moved into position for a rapid assault across the river at other locations. Once the midstream islands were secured, General Kuroki ordered a feint on the lower Yalu River when Japanese gunboats engaged Cossack detachments at the river mouth. This convinced General Zasulich that the main Japanese attack would be in the area of the town of Antong, and he concentrated his forces there. Kuroki was thus able to maneuver against the weak Russian left and deployed the 12th Division and Guards Division across the Yalu River at a fordable point. The Russians watched these movements with a bit of trepidation as they understood that they had been bluffed. General Kashtalinsky informed General Zasulich that the Japanese were about to assault the position in force and that 
his position was in danger of being flanked. Zasulich chose to ignore the reports, thinking that this new attack was the fate. He redeployed only a single battalion with four guns. Zasulich remained convinced that the main Japanese attack would be at Antung and kept his main force, as well as his reserves, at that location. The Japanese main attack began in the early morning hours of April 27th. By 0300 or 3 a.m., the balance of the 12th Division had crossed the river and was advancing in three columns. While the 12th Division was advancing on the right, the Guards Division was moving into position in the center. By 0400, the artillery of the Guards Division was within range of the exposed Russian lines. The Japanese First Army continued its three-pronged advance and was across the Yalu by midnight on April 29th. There was very little opposition. Limited visibility masked the Japanese movements from Russian observation. When the fog finally lifted at about 5 a.m., the Japanese artillery opened up on the Russian formations. The second division took its position on the center, advancing on the newly erected causeways, heading from the town of Weiju, and catching the Russians in a pincher movement at the hamlet of Chulianchuang, Chulianching, on the Manchurian side of the Yalu River, opposite Weiju. By 10 a.m., the Russians were in full retreat with the Japanese attempt to block their escape towards Feng Huang Cheng to the north. The Japanese had a number of 4.7 inch howitzers made specially for them by Krupp. They used them to devastating effect on the exposed Russians. Because of this, General Zazulich's staff strongly encouraged him to pull back to a more defensible position. The general refused to listen. He even sent a telegram to the Tsar in St. Petersburg, informing him that a victory was soon certain. He chose to ignore General Kuropatkin's phased withdrawal orders. General Kuroki had planned to continue the advance of the 12th Division to trap the Russian left. However, now that the enemy artillery had been neutralized, he decided to have the Guards and the 2nd Division attack at the same time as the 12th Division. At this point, the Japanese met with the first serious resistance from the Russian defenses. The advance of the 2nd Division was held up for a time, and had any of the Russian artillery survived, the outcome might have been very different. The Russians were driven from their trenches with severe losses, and the survivors fell back to the tops of hills. This was actually the position that Zasulich's officers were trying to get him to fall back to earlier. During the retreat, a counterattack was made by parts of the Russian 12th East Siberian Rifle Regiment, which was cut to pieces and ordered further breaks, opened further breaks in the Russian lines. The Russian position would now became totally untenable and the remaining units were in danger of being circled. 
General Zasulich was ordered to retreat. The 11th East Siberian Rifle Regiment, which was covering the retreat, was cut off by the Japanese and suffered large numbers of casualties during its breakthrough back to other Russian forces. At the appearance of the Japanese 12th Division, the Russian left flank panicked and collapsed. At 17.30 or 5.30 p.m. on May 1st, the remains of the Russian Eastern Detachment either surrendered or escaped towards Feng Huang Cheng to the north, and the Battle of the Yalu River was over. The Battle of the Yalu River ended in victory for Japan. The combat had cost the Japanese 1,036 dead and wounded out of the total 1st Army strength of 42,500. The Russian Eastern Detachment suffered about 2,700 casualties in total, including about 500 killed, 1,000 wounded, 600 prisoners, and the loss of 21 of 24 field guns. The Battle of Nanshan. The Battle of Nanshan took place on May 24th to May 26th, 1904, across a two mile wide defense line across the narrowest part of the Laodong Peninsula. This area covered the approaches to Port Arthur and on the 116 meter high Nanshan Hill in present day Jizhou district north of the city center of Dalian, Liaoning, China. After the Japanese victory at the Yalu River, the Japanese second army commanded by General Yasutaka Oku landed on the Laodong Peninsula, only 60 miles from Port Arthur. The second army was 35,500 strong and consisted of three divisions. They were the first division from Tokyo, the third division from Nagoya, and the fourth division from Osaka. The landing was completed by May 5th. The Japanese intention was to break through the Russian defensive position, capture the port city of Dalny, and lay siege to Port Arthur. Russian Viceroy Yevgeny Alexeyev had been recalled to Moscow for consultations with the Tsar. He had left Major General Baron Anatoly Stosel in command of Russian ground forces in the Kwantung Peninsula and Admiral Vitgeft in control of the Russian fleet at Port Arthur. Since no direct orders had been left, the indecisive and incompetent Admiral Vitgeft allowed the Japanese landing to proceed unopposed. General Stosel had about 17,000 men, and the 4th, 5th, 13th, 14th, and 15th East Siberian Rifles from which about 3,000 men of the 5th East Siberian Rifles under Colonel Nikolai Tretyakov were dug into fortified positions on Nanshan Hill where they planned to hold out despite knowing 
though they would be greatly outnumbered. The reserve divisions were under the command of Lieutenant General Alexander Falk, a former police officer who had risen to his position through political patronage rather than experience or ability. The Russian forces had 114 pieces of field artillery, machine guns, and a dug-in network of trenches and barbed wire. The Japanese were well aware of the fortifications, as Colonel Doi of Japanese intelligence was one of the thousands of Chinese laborers recruited by the Russians to work on their project in 1903. On May 24th, during a heavy thunderstorm, the Japanese 4th Division, under the command of Lieutenant General Ogawa Mataji, attacked the walled town of Chinjo, which is in modern-day Jinzhou district. This was just north of Nanzan Hill. Despite being defended by no more than 400 men with outdated artillery, the 4th Division failed on two attempts to breach its gates. Two battalions from the 1st Division attacked independently at 0530 or 530 a.m. On May 25th. They finally breached the defenses and took the town. With the flag, his flank secure, General Oku could then begin the main assault on the entrenched Russian forces on Nanshan Hill. The assault was postponed a day due to the weather. On May 26th, Oku began uh, with a prolonged artillery barrage from Japanese gunboats offshore, followed by infantry assaults by all three of his divisions. The Russians, with mines, Maxim machine guns, and barbed wire obstacles, inflicted heavy losses on the Japanese during repeated assaults. By 1800 or 6 p.m., after nine attempts, the Japanese had failed to overrun the firmly entrenched Russian positions. Oku had committed all of his reserves. Both sides used up most of their artillery ammunition. Finding his calls for reinforcement unanswered, Colonel Tretyakov was amazed to find that uncommitted reserve regiments were in full retreat, and that his remaining ammunition reserves had been blown up under orders of General Falk. Falk, paranoid of a possible Japanese landing between his position and the safety of Port Arthur, was panicked by a flanking attack by the decimated Japanese 4th Division along the west coast. In his rush to flee the battle, Falk had neglected to tell Tretyakov of the order to retreat. And Tretyakov thus found himself in the precarious position, position of being encircled. With no ammunition, and no reserve force available for a counterattack. Tretyakov had no choice but to order his troops to fall back to the second defensive line. By 1920 or 720, the Japanese flag flew from the summit of Nanshan Hill. Tretyakov, who had fought well and who had lost only 400 men during the battle lost 650 more men in his unsupported retreat back to the main defensive lines around Port Arthur. 
The results were that the Russians lost a total of about 1,400 killed, wounded, and missing during the battle. The Japanese did not win lightly. They lost about 6,198 casualties, but they could claim victory. Among the 738-9 dead was the eldest son of General Nogi Marusuke. The Japanese had fired 34,000 artillery shells during this battle. This was more than had been spent in the entire First Sino-Japanese War. The Japanese had also fired 2.19 million rifle and machine gun rounds in one day of fighting. This was more than the number about 2 million fired by the Prussians during the entire Austro-Prussian War. Due to lack of ammunition, the Japanese could not move from Nanshan until May 30th. To their amazement, they found that the Russians had made no effort to hold the strategically valuable and easily defendable port of Dalny, but had retreated all the way back to Port Arthur. Although the town had been looted by local civilians, the harbor, equipment, warehouses, and railroad yards were all left intact. After Japan occupied Dalny, a memorial tower was erected on top of Nanshan Hill with a poem by General Oku. The tower was demolished after the Pacific War, we know as World War II. Only the foundation is left. A portion of the stone tablet with the poem is now displayed in the Lushun prison in Dalian. On May 3rd, Admiral Togo made his third and final attempt at blocking the entrance to Port Arthur. This time he used eight old transports. This attempt also failed. but Togo claimed it as a success so that it would clear the way for the Japanese second army to land in Manchuria. Although Port Arthur was as good as blocked due to the lack of initiative by a marker of successors and acting commander since Skridlov was not there, Japanese naval losses began to mount. On May 15th, two Japanese battleships 12,320-ton Yashima and the 15,300-ton Hatsuse sank in a minefield off Port Arthur. They both struck at least two mines each. This eliminated one-third of Japan's battleship force. This was the worst day for the Japanese Navy during the war. Further naval operations from Port Arthur resulted in two breakout attempts by the Russians. The first was on June 23, 1904. The acting commander for the Russian squadron was Admiral Wilhelm Wittgift. They failed, and by the end of the month, Japanese artillery was firing shells into the harbor area. The second attempt was on August 10. It resulted in the Battle of the Yellow Sea, and that battle was tactically inconclusive. After that, the Russian fleet did not make any more attempts to break out from the port. The Japanese fleet dominated the waters of East Asia for the duration of the war. But mines laid by Russian mine layers were a continuing problem for the IJM and resulted in more losses. On September 18, 1904, the 2,150-ton gunboat Heian struck a Russian mine west of Port Arthur and sank. 
On November 30th, the 2,440-ton cruiser Saiyan hit a mine and sank in the same minefield. On December 13th, the 4,160-ton cruiser Takasago sank in another Russian minefield a few miles south of Port Arthur while giving naval gunfire support to the Japanese armies that were besieging the port at the time.